<laughs> Please, if you can take your seats to start. Please, if you can take your seats. Is the speaker working? Is it working? Very good. Yeah, I see red, but I don't see them sitting. Please, if we can sit to start. We have a very short time for this session. It's very important that we start now. Please, if we can close the doors. OK. Please close the doors. Thank you so much. So let me pass the floor to the moderator. Good morning, and welcome to this special event on the true cost of food at the UN Food System Summit stock taking moment. My name is Jen Yates. I'm the director of the TCA Accelerator, a global network advocating for the transition to a just, sustainable, and healthy food system through widespread adoption of true cost accounting. I will be, I will be serving as the moderator for this event today. It is widely understood that while agri-food systems generate significant benefits to society, they are also contributing to major global challenges such as climate change, natural resource degradation, and alarming trends for human health due to changing dietary patterns. Agri-food systems must transform if we are to meet the Sustainable Development Goals and International Climate and Biodiversity Framework targets. Indeed, it was this recognition that led to the convening of the first UN Food System Summit two years ago. Government leaders are working alongside civil society and private sector actors to identify and implement solutions that can transform food systems with the urgency demanded by the challenges that we face. Today we are going to hear from some of the public and private sector leaders working to advance meaningful and lasting solutions by deploying approaches to understand the true cost of food. They will offer insights on how these approaches first measure agri-food systems' hidden cost and benefits and then turn this knowledge into actions that enhance value for people and nature. This session will feature opening remarks from Mr. Pavan Suktev, CEO of Just Impact. This will be followed by a panel discussion among distinguished government, civil society, and private sector leaders with time for audience questions to follow. Finally, we will conclude with closing remarks from Mr. Maximo Torero, Chief Economist at FAO. With that, I welcome Mr. Pavan Sukta for his opening remarks. Thank you, Jen, and uh, thank you, distinguished uh, excellencies, friends, ladies and gentlemen. In the next uh, seven minutes, I shall try and take you through perhaps seven years of quite significant developments in the world of food systems, their measurement and their management. Uh, there's quite a lot that we knew about food systems. Can we have my slides? Even in 2016. Um, at that time, the Global Nutrition Report um, had already forecast some of the issues that were to come in terms of recognizing that our diets have become the number one burden of disease. And at that time, uh, the picture of the results of our food systems is somewhat like this, that out of the seven billion people, there was a large two billion who were deficient in micronutrients, and that included, of course, the 800 million who were starving. At the same time, our food systems resulted in 1.9 billion being overweight, out of which 700 million were actually obese. Now, this is not a result that one can be proud of uh, within the overall space of food systems. Seven years ago, we knew this. Um, later on, the, the study of the Global Burden of Disease study in, in the Lancet reconfirmed some of these issues. Merely diabetes had an estimated cost of about $825 billion. On the environmental side, again, there were significant things that we knew seven years ago. Uh, this is from the International Resource Panel and the section on food systems and natural resources from the United Nations Environment Program. We knew that more than 60% of terrestrial biodiversity loss could be attributed to food systems, especially agri-commodities. And a significant part of greenhouse gas emissions, now it depends how you measure these, 24% um, or it could be higher if you take the value chain of food into account, including the deforestation 
uh, that takes place upstream and the transportation that takes place downstream, the numbers could be much, much higher than that. And of course, a third of soil degradation and two thirds of fish stock depletion, again, attributable to food systems. In short order, therefore, uh, seven years ago, we knew that our food systems were broken in more ways than one. We had hunger, malnutrition, obesity, diet-related diseases, soil health disasters, greenhouse gas emissions, freshwater scarcity, almost 70 to 90% of the freshwater used is basically food for food production. And yet to manage all of this complexity, we were using something as simple as per hectare productivity of single crops. By any thought or yardstick, that is not an adequate way of measuring the performance of food systems. I've always said that you cannot manage what you do not measure. Uh, this is a refrain which some of you worked in the TEEB project, the Economics of Ecosystems and Lab and Biodiversity would have heard me repeat many times. And we heard from Agnes Kalibata in the last uh, session that if you can't count, you don't count. And I totally agree with her, and this is absolutely true. Not only must we learn how to count, but we must have standards for how to count so that we don't go around counting in different ways, which is even a problem. And the importance of standardize, standardization is one of the reasons why the United Nations has made a tremendous uh, effort successfully at the national level to replace the old yardstick of GDP and to create instead a system of of accounts, which is uh, and a system of inclusive wealth reporting led by Professor Partha Das Gupta and his, his friends from the United Nations. Those same four capitals for, of natural capital, human capital, and social capital, together with the already measured produced capital impacts, which are there in the GDP and they are there in the profits of corporations. That's the holistic approach that, Again, in 2016, a new project called TEEB for Agriculture and Food, I'm delighted to have Salman in the audience here who was a key part of that project. Um, that project began by using the same national framework and applying it to a food system level. And it's been applied since then to many studies, to many areas and to many projects of natural systems and natural farming. However, the one that I'll mention specifically is one which again, seven years ago began in the Indian state of Andhra Pradesh. And this was about ensuring that we could look at the uh, food systems in Andhra Pradesh, not with the narrow lens of per hectare productivity, but with a comprehensive framework, in fact prescribed by the United Nations study called the TEEP for Agriculture and Food. So this study was not measuring merely uh, the GDP contributions at the natural landscape level or the infrastructure and equipment level or the food and farm level, but it was measuring everything else that is important in food systems, including the provisioning and regulating and maintenance services from the agricultural systems and the, the health impacts of those systems, both on farm and off farm, the emissions of the, of the food production, and of course the social values for the farming communities who carried out the agriculture, and of course, uh, understanding of the risks and the resilience factors of these systems. This study was for a project that was initiated by the self-help groups in Andhra Pradesh, led by a retired government officer, Mr. Vijayathalam, who went to them, he was the one who had actually led the setting up of the microfinance groups in Andhra Pradesh way back uh, 20 years ago, went back to the same self-help groups led by women asking if they would join him in a food system revolution, and they said yes. And what we have today, ladies and gentlemen, is a women-led movement which began with a few thousand women and now has reached 750,000 farmers. When people, ask me, when people ask me about scale, that is scale. And, I'm sorry. Sorry? Yeah. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> he's asking me to hold back. <laughs> that is scale. So this is the state of Andhra Pradesh. It's in, in the southeast side of India. And uh, as you can see, it's an agroecologically diverse region, which includes uh, three broad areas. The Krishna and Godavari Delta region, which is in the middle. It, in, it has on the left-hand side, the southwest side, a dryland area, which is largely rain-fed and low input, farming is practiced there. 
the, the delta area has typically high input farming because it's for rice growing. And then there's a tribal area in the northeast side, which is, I would say, default organic, if I may put it thus, because the farmers there are too poor to be able to afford much by way of pesticides and fertilizers. This study was essentially looking at natural farming, which is a way of regenerating soil health. It's all about putting bacteria back in the soil using essentially the residues of cow, cattle, cattle faces and cattle urine, mixing that with food for the bacteria, that is uh, molasses and gram flour, topping it up with 10 times as much water and letting this soup stir for a few days and then using that as the inoculant. It's not a fertilizer, it's a soil inoculant. And also pushing through several other practices such as testing seeds and using seeds which are uh, cleared by the same kind of uh, soup. And finally also using mulching, constant mulching and planting crops in rows so that you have at the, low, at the lowest level you have um, you know, uh, red gram and black gram, and behind that you have chili, which is highly profitable, and then behind that you have maize, and then behind that you have the fruit trees, the papaya trees, and the pomegranate trees, and so on, and then repeat. So it's a way of ensuring that as each crop matures, you, uh, you use the residue of that for mulching, and it reduces the, the, the use of water. This kind of approach has been hugely successful, and uh, the study demonstrates three different dimensions. So as I said, this study is the first part of a two-part series. The first part is completed, looking at the yield, the profits of the farms, looking at the social impacts in the communities across these 12 villages that were selected for study. In fact, four villages in each area, two pairs of two villages, and it's quite complex collecting the data, as was pointed out in the last panel, because you have to select villages which have enough concentration of one or the other kind of farming. Too much mixing of neighbors then creates uh, uh, difficulty in making any, any sensible measurements. So this study was, was conducted over the last few years, from 2020 onwards, and the key results are on the economic side, that the yields have actually gone up on average, 11%, and that's an average, because there are certain things like chilies where it's, it's, it's almost doubling of yield. Uh, the crop diversity has doubled. The net income of farmers has gone up almost 50%, 49%. This, ladies and gentlemen, is huge because more incomes in the hands of poor farmers is basically a key solution to poverty. And there is a huge amount of rural poverty that is, in fact, in the farming areas, these fragile regions of the world. So here we have a potential significant solution towards global poverty sitting in front of us, which is also climate positive, water positive, yield positive, and environmentally positive, less, less damage impacts on nature. Equally interesting are the fact that the societies that's formed on the back of these women's self-help groups, with women being in the lead, almost 40% of all of these so-called uh, farmers are women, and many are in a higher proportion of the master farmers who actually teach the system from village to village are women. We find a huge degree of measurable increased cohesion of collaboration and cooperation in these communities. And last but not the least, on-farm health is better. There are one-third fewer cases of significant loss of man days, so disability-adjusted life years are much better for that. All of this is possible, so I end by uh, quoting my fellow uh, countrywoman, uh, Arundhati Das, the author, when she said that another world is not only possible, she is on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. Thank you. Thank you, Pavan. We're now going to move into our panel discussion, and I will briefly introduce our panelists today. To my right, I uh, would like to welcome Minister Franklin Mithika Linturi from Kenya Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock Development. On my left, uh, Vice Minister Fernanda Machiavelli uh, of the Brazil Ministry of Agrarian Development and Family Agriculture. We have uh, Mr. Giro uh, Indarto, from, he is the Director of Food and Agriculture for the Ministry of National Development Planning of Indonesia. Mr. Alwin Kapsha, Head of the International Affairs and Food Systems Unit of the Swiss Confederation Federal Office of Agriculture. Ms. Victoria de Bourbon de Palme, 
with the, who is the Food Transformation Lead with the World Benchmarking Alliance, and Mr. Barry Martin, member of the Managing Board of Rabobank, and finally, Mr. Lawrence Haddad, Global Alliance for, the in, for Improved Nutrition. And welcome all of you to the stage today. We are going to move directly into some questions, so I'd like to ask each of our panelists uh, to answer the first question. If you could share one specific instance of how you are working to understand food system costs and benefits, and how this has led to different proposed interventions than have been pursued in the past. And we'll start here with Minister Linturi. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to participate and discuss and share my thoughts on um, what uh, we are able or we can be able to do to ensure that uh, the cost of food or to what system, the, the, the issues that we have to discuss to ones addressing the true cost of food. Uh, we all agree that we are sitting here and discussing the true cost of food because we all have come to the realization that the world, as we move forward, has a potential of around 9.1 billion people that requires to be fed by the year 2050. And if we have to ensure that these people are properly fed, then we must have uh, proper mechanisms on how we really need to focus and plan the ones uh, achieving food for all by that particular period. And food, and I am happy that the discussion has shifted to not only discussing food, but food and nutrition, because we require food that is uh, nutritious enough that has the right con con uh, quantities of the right nutrients that can be able to maintain life and, and growth. But uh, as we get into this discussion, uh, many things come into our mind. So what is it that is making food so expensive and affordable, out of reach of very many people? Different factors or reasons will arise from different parts of the world. But from my perspective as a, a farmer practitioner, and this is what I would want to share, is that uh, uh, producing food is not that very easy because of the various uh, factors that affect it. One, the high cost of production is, an, is, is, is really an issue that we require to see how we internalize and be able to address it because the high cost of input prices are skyrocketing. The cost of fertilizer is an issue that really affects the cost of food. In fact, when you also get the fertilizer and it's not appealing to the farmers during, uh, within the right uh, time, then becomes or affects you. And so right, the access to inputs, the access at the right particular time is, is critical to addressing this cost. Um, we also have the issues to do with labor. So how, how expensive is labor? The people that we employ into our farms to do the farming. How accessible is mechanized farming, depending on which part of the world that we all live in. So these are variables that will de define, de depend from one area to another. And for example, in Kenya, because we really need, uh, we are working on towards an ambitious program to mechanize so that we're able to bring the cost of labor. Because we have an, age, an aging farmer population of around 60 years is the average age of a farmer. And we have the potential of bringing the cost of labor down if we were to encourage our own young population to get into farming. But we are not there yet because we must be able to change the mind the mindset, uh, the, the, there must be a paradigm shift for, for the children to be able to embrace agriculture uh, uh, as business. And this is because, you know, for certain historical, cultural uh, reasons. So that cost of labor highly affects the cost of food. We, going by the FAO uh, statistics and data, 40% of our our food is lost after, after harvest. So the management of post-harvest uh, losses is also very critical if we really have to deal with uh, the cost of, of food. There is pests. Pests is also an, a serious menace that affects uh, food. We may, grow, uh, we may grow food, we may have our farms, but the migratory pests like the fall armyworm, the desert locust, is an issue that uh, we also have to manage because once we've put our 
land into cultivation, and we must be able to manage it until we've harvested, we've been able to, for example, with cereals and drying them to the right moisture levels, being able to store so that none or very small percentage is lost through post-harvest uh, losses so that we are able to maintain uh, some bit of high quantities of food that is available in the markets and because of the forces of demand and supply when there is much, of course, the cost comes down. We also cannot forget that uh, the issues to do with the climate change are really serious issues that the world has to contend with and see how this, uh, uh, the impact that is causing to uh, the cost of food in, in our nations. And um, in Africa, most of us are really highly depend on rain fed agriculture. So if we have to bring the cost of production, and I'm happy that we are working on a program how we can have our land irrigated, bring our farmers into irrigation and run away from a rain fed agriculture, then we'll be able to produce enough food regardless of the shocks that we've suffered over a long time out of the effects of climate change. We've had a drought of, for four and five years, Kenya has not handed rain. And you can imagine, we lost around 2.5 million hands of cattle during this period. And the impact of that loss is huge, so it's great. So there are many issues that are, for example, poor infrastructure. When we do our farming, how we get market access, our produce to the markets within the right uh, uh, time so that there are no losses, are also factors that uh, really affect uh, or bring some bearing to the cost of food that uh, we, are, we, we are trying uh, to, to address. And uh, whenever we are trying to grow food, uh, we grow it on land. Our, most of our soils are sick. So land degradation for having for a very long time out of growth has really caused loss of uh, soil health due to uh, overuse. And for that matter, as we, we, dis we are working on this, it's an issue that we're also trying to deal with so that we can see how to fertilize and make our shows more, uh, uh, more, more, uh, more fertile so that we are able to, and to be able to produce food that, is, that, that, that can be able really to support our, our population. So uh, this uh, aspect of the cost of food is uh, the cost of food has very many parameters or issues that affect its cost. And that is why you also find that uh, uh, food of the right quantity or the right nutrition could be uh, is almost cannot be accessed by many people. And I think that's why all over the world, whatever forum I've been able to, to, uh, to attend in most cases, the discussion in the world is how expensive is our food? How can we bring it down? What can we do to ensure that each one of us is able to access food in the right quantity, the right nutrition, because we can't live without it? Thank you. Vice Minister Machiavelli. Good morning. Good morning to everyone. Uh, it is an honor to be here speaking on behalf of Brazil. In a country like Brazil, it is not difficult to see the contradictions surrounding the costs of food systems. We have a rich bio biodiversity, family farming capable to producing diversified food, and conventional agriculture that supplies commodities to the world. On the other hand, we took over the government this year with around 30 million people in a situation of food insecurity, an increase in chronic, in the chronic disease caused by poor diets, a decrease in food production, and high rates of deforestation caused by the expansion of pastures. In addition, as everybody, we have been affected by climate change with a severe drought in the south of the country caused causing huge losses of production. President Lula's government is committed to transform this reality. We have been working to build more sustainable, health, and inclusive food systems. Food systems that are capable of producing health food in a sustainable way at affordable prices for the population. 
food systems that generate fair income for family farmers and other workers involved in food production and distribution. distribution. Food systems that ensure access to the health diets for all people. A first step in this process was the resumption of public policies building in the, nine, in the 2000s for food security and the strengthening of family farming. Policies that allowed us to uh, get out of the insecurity food map by farm. One of the public policies resumed in 2023 is the national policy on agroecology and organic production, which integrates and adapts programs that enhance the agroecological tra transition of various government agencies. It is a policy that has a systemic vision, which works from production to consumption. In addition, we resumed the harvest plan for family farming, with a reduction in interest rates for food production and financing financing lines for social biodiversity products, organic and agroecological production. The government, made, the government made available $15 billion in credit only for family farming this year, the biggest volume in our history. It involves also uh, a microfinance program that operates in the northeast of Brazil, which is our poorest uh, region, focus on the rural women. To overcome hunger and guarantee the commercialization of production, we also recreated the food acquisition program. This program uh, in this program, the government buys food from family farmers and donates it to the social assistance network and to the most vulnerable, vulnerable citizens. Another policy implemented by the Brazilian government establishes minimum prices for social biodiversity products. It aims to support the sustainable extraction and sale of products from Brazilian social biodiversity, guaranteeing minimum prices for 17 products, including nuts, herds of palm, and fish. In addition, we support the dissemination of good agroecological production practices through the technical assistance and rural extension policy for the family farmers. In this sense, we established a national packet focused on the agroecological transition. Finally, we are working on the tax reform that is under analysis in the Brazilian parliament. In this regard, the ongoing reform intends to include in the Brazilian constitution the provision for the creation of a basic national food basket which should have zero taxation and which we intend to include mainly health foods. Our, ba our battle on this front is also to ensure the creation of a selective tax, which allows the application of additional special taxation to the products that are harmful to the health and the environment, including ultra-processed ultra food and also food that are not environmental, environmentally sustainable. The second step uh, is also is the formulation of a second generation policies that will address the new challenges connecting food security policies, environmental policies, and agricultural policy tools and make them to work together. Uh, Brazil is back. We are happy to be here in FAO, and uh, I would like to thank you very much. Mr. Indarto. Very good morning, and thank you. To, it is our honor to be invited in this uh, very important topic, discussing about true cost of uh, food. Uh, let me start with introducing our agri-food sector in Indonesia. We have population more than 250 million people separated and distributed unevenly across the country that consists of more than 30 provinces and more than 500 districts in Indonesia. Uh, and it is projected that in the next 20 years, our population will be more than 320 million people, meaning that agri-food sector in Indonesia 
have to have capacity and to increase our domestic capacity to feed all individual in Indonesia. Uh, Agri-food sector in Indonesia is not only uh, taking, playing very important role to feed the people, but also it is the main source of the income of the farm uh, of our people. It is main source of the labor in Indonesia, and it is source of our domestic stability. And our agri-food sectors is uh, very fortunate because our biodiversity is very, very rich in Indonesia. However, we also still facing many, many challenges. For example, uh, our stunting rate is still very high, although in the past several years, it is uh, dropping very significantly. And also, uh, we have still uh, an issue of lack uh, some of micronutrient deficiencies, especially for the poor and vulnerable people. On the uh, another side, we see that we have very high potential to uh, to utilize and also to exercise our biodiversity and also our richness of uh, socio-cultural in Indonesia to deal with several challenges that we have. <clears throat> For example, uh, in the issue of food loss and waste, uh, based on our study done by Bapenas and also supported by several uh, development partners, our food loss and waste is estimated around uh, 115 kilogram per capita per year, meaning that we are not only losing food, but also we are losing money. We are losing potential to reduce the CO2 emission. In that regard, uh, the government uh, having very concern about uh, food, and also we did, and we still has been doing several studies on uh, food. For example, we are supported by uh, WFP to study on the cost of diets. And the finding is very interesting, where uh, uh, the nutritious food is relatively pricey. And also, we see also the very significant difference across the country, because you know that Indonesia consists of three time zones. So it is very big, and the different price between uh, region is very high. Other study also on uh, tip agri-food we are trying to, uh, to improve the way the farmers uh, do the on-farm. For example, by improving the, the, the agroforestry, so measuring between uh, several types of uh, commodities. So then we can increase the, the productivity of land with several commodities, and also uh, we are trying to uh, give uh, more diversified food for farmers because they are planting several, uh, several commodities. I think I will end this statement so far, and we are uh, very happy to, to learn from other countries about true cost of food, and we are, we are uh, willing to share our knowledge to others. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Mr. Kapsha. Hey, thank you very much, a moderator. Good morning, everybody. I think we are all here because we know that a, we need to transform our food systems in order 
so that we achieve the SDGs and to make them a more resilient. However, the current today's food systems do not adequately address the environmental and social costs related to food production and a food consumption. These externalities need to be taken into account. A lot is already now known on the environmental side of the issue, a little bit less on, on the social costs. Switzerland recognizes the need to accelerate food systems transformation and uh, we are working uh, on it. Redesigning and repurposing a, of a public policies and support will be key a, to make the transformation happen. True cost accounting will be an important a, instrument to get the repurposing right a, this time. So a, the federal government, the federal council a, of Switzerland issued last year a report on the future orientation of agriculture a policy. It provides a vision till a 2050 and sets a little bit of a calendar how we should go about reforming our food system. It embraces actually a food systems approach, which is, which is a first time that, that it does that. And it aims to link, to uh, create strong links between production and consumption of food. The federal government proposes to work on true costs of food and to increase a transparency related to that. And I'm happy to say that the Parliament a, welcomed that strategy and a, requested that we a, develop a dispatch of law a, to be presented 2027 that a, puts this strategy into, into practice. So we do have actually a quite a solid basis to work on true costs in Switzerland. A li limited market, a transparency and insufficient consideration of these externalities are disincentives to sustainable, healthy and animal welfare friendly a purchasing behavior. Therefore, a, it is necessary to ensure that the consumer have, the, have access to the relevant information. Currently, my colleagues in Bern undertake in-depth work to better embrace two costs in our policy instruments. This starts with developing the understanding of the true costs of the Swiss food system and will lead into the development of a appropriate, adequate policy tools, such as a fostering transparency throughout the supply chain, incentive mechanisms, and, and the like. So, but we just really start that, that work. But Switzerland imports about half of the food uh, we consume. So true cost accounting will have to take into account these cross-border uh, relations. We believe that this true uh, uh, cost accounting has to be done uh, objectively and in a non-discriminatory uh, manner as trade is, is concerned there. So we believe it is best to do a this analysis within a recognized international analytical a framework. Unfortunately, such a framework doesn't really exist, but we do actually welcome the work of FAO on the SOFA 2023 on a true cost of food. I think that's a wonderful opportunity and thanks to FAO that they do that. And Switzerland will work with FAO for the next SOFA 2024 to produce a case, a country case study on true costs in Switzerland. We do hope that this will provide us with a deeper understanding of the issues and that we will then be able to forward some policy recommendations that will go to Parliament. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Victoria de Bourbon de Parme. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I firstly want to applaud really the, all these government initiatives that we've heard about because uh, as we've heard the, the costs uh, and the negative impacts of our food systems are huge. But I do want to bring a positive light to this all as well. Um, and while this session is called True Cost of Food, there is a tremendous value in food. And almost in every aspect that you've heard, whether it's climate change, so on emissions, whether it's on biodiversity loss or the nutritional effects of poor diets to, uh, related to non-communicable diseases, all, each and every one of those can be turned around. It can be transformative into something positive. And I think that is really the tremendous power and magic of food systems. Now, I'm representing an organization where we look at the private sector. So we assess the private sector on food systems. 
And while governments are, are at the center stage here in, uh, in this stock taking and also here on the panel, I think we put a lot of expectations and a lot of pressure on governments to do this almost single-handedly. What are we asking the private sector? I would really encourage everyone in the audience here as well, how are you reaching out to the private sector? How are you holding the private sector accountable to also deliver on these transformations? There's such tremendous benefits, and uh, as was referenced also by, uh, by Pavan in his, in his opening remarks, currently our system reinforces business as usual. So how can we make negative actions consequential, but also how can we make positive actions positively consequential? I heard really interesting things, you know, um, what especially the representative of Brazil mentioned as well on investments, procurement, tax reforms. Uh, we'll probably hear about financial incentives as well. It should be coming all together, but I really feel that we also should be holding certain, especially big industries that have bigger uh, global revenues than certain countries' GDP. GDPs, we should hold them accountable to deliver. And what does accountability mean? I know it's sensitive here that, that perhaps we don't want, of course we don't want big ag and big food to dominate these discussions. But is the solution to keep them out of the room? I would advocate that it isn't. I would advocate that we need them at the table. We need them to be, feel responsible and we need them on a country level to, to, to create actions and to create implementations for a positive transformation. So I'm looking forward to working with people here in the room and, and, and the panelists here today. And, um, and I really feel that uh, the, the true value and the true cost of food principles are at the heart of the transformation for food systems. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are running low on time and we have a couple of panelists left. Mr. Barry Martin, please go. Well, thank you. And uh, well, thank you for having me. And uh, I'm here uh, yeah, as, a, as a financial institution Right, so I'm happy to, uh, to talk a little bit about uh, our perspective also as a bank that finds farmers in all the continents except Antarctica. So it, it is it's very important for us that we understand that as we are now, when we traditionally as a bank uh, look at financing, we traditionally look at actually certain things. We look at risk and we look at return and we look at cash flows, how our actual loan is going to repay. We have that fiduciary responsibility uh, to our depositors. We are now working very hard as a as financial institution to try to understand how do we include sustainability in our decision making. More and more we are doing that. But what we're looking at is that we actually are looking more and more only to the carbon angle and not looking at the the total, and as we look, and I said, Victoria, thank you for that, the true value of that loan that we are giving out. So I have here, so we, we as an industry have been issuing green bonds, uh, we have been issuing sustainability linked loans, we have given discounts, but it's not enough. And that's the reason why I come here, that's the reason why we are true believers as Rabobank organization, and we also part of the true value of food initiative. The way I look at this, is that we need to make sure that we have the right measures. If you want to have, you want to attract more financial institutions, more liquidity, more investors, you need to actually be able to, what are you actually putting on the table? As long as we are not able to measure social impact, and I'm saying the positive and the negative social impact of a loan, as long as we cannot measure the biodiversity impact of a loan and the positive and the negative, as long as we cannot measure the water which is going into a loan, as long as we cannot, and I can go on and go on, and think about the health and etc. Today we actually only measure one and sometimes two, and as I said, one, we measure the financial cash flow, we measure the carbon, but we don't measure the other ones and don't price them. So I actually have a big dream. So in my organization, we are really working on how would it be that we could issue a bond, a true value bond in the New York market, where actually it's not only talking about the interest rate, but actually there is a social rate, there's a water rate, there's biodiversity rate. You think about that. Is that, and as an investor, you actually have to say, okay, I'm getting a return on those metrics, all those metrics. But to be able to do that, we really need to make sure that we had the metrics right. And here I'm having governments and uh, the FAO institutions, we need to agree what are we talking about. We only will get liquidity into those transformations 
if, and Victoria, you're working on that, and you do the lot of measurements, if we can measure and we can reward, but reward is also punishing. You have to have the two sides, right? So I really hope uh, that in the, in the discussion we are having here in this uh, stock taking, we also talk about how do we measure we reward and how we punish. Sorry that I'm being very clear on that one, because otherwise it's not going to work. It's that the only the system is working like that. And then you can reward proper nutrition. And then let me just finish uh, also for as, as, as part of the true value of food initiative that we will be launching in the COP28 uh, a light uh, country engagement guidance tool so that we can actually track uh, the true value in, in each of the countries. So, and, and the idea is that as you can track in the coming years, the True Value Initiative go, uh, building up to the COP30 in uh, Para, if I'm not mistaken, uh, right, in Belém, uh, is that we then can say, okay, where are we really making those costs? Where is actually the, 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 the trade-offs that we're doing today for short-term revenues, uh, for long-term social health of our society? Thank you very much. And we will give the last word on this panel to Mr. Lawrence Haddad. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jen. I must say you're doing an incredible job of managing such a big panel. It's so big, I didn't even realize Maximo was on the same panel as me. <laughs> Hi, Maximo. Um, I was asked to give one specific example of how GAIN is working to understand food system costs and benefits. So I want to focus on animal source foods, because I think that's uh, it's a controversial uh, subject, but I think it's a subject that true cost accounting and true value of food approaches can really help us navigate this complex, politically difficult terrain. So in Mozambique, we are working with the government of Mozambique and a whole range of researchers and implementers for a very large program funded by the Dutch government. Thank you, Dutch government. Funded uh, by the government. And its, its goal is to improve the improve, not increase, improve the consumption of animal source food in Mozambique. So in every country, there are usually sort of three groups of consumers. There's a group of consumers that are consuming too many animal source foods, way above what the uh, dietary guidelines for that country would recommend. And they clearly have to decrease their consumption. That's good for their health. It's good for the environment. There's a second group that is on the verge, on the cusp of increasing consumption dramatically because they are urbanizing, their incomes are going up. We can't do too much about moderating that consumption. We can do a bit, but it's, there's a lot of pent-up demand in there. So we can moderate that a bit through demand creation activities and regulations and incentives. But really what we need to do with that group is figure out how do we minimize the environmental damage that's produced by that group. And the third group is the group that we are most focused on again, which is here's a group that's consuming hardly any animal source foods, but we know animal source foods are very important for those with very high nutritional requirements, infants, uh, adolescent girls, uh, young mothers. So, so, these are, so what do we do with that group? And so in Mozambique, we're struggling with that issue at the moment. And we're, uh, again, five years ago, would have simply plowed ahead uh, without, without thinking about the environmental costs. But we are now thinking very hard about the environmental costs. We have to, we have to choose animal source foods that are nutritious, are affordable, um, for which there is a business case for the private sector, and are environmentally, um, environmentally acceptable to the, to the ecosystem. So uh, do we have any degrees of freedom in this? Yes, we do, because different animal source foods have very different profiles when it comes to nutrition, affordability, environment, and business case. And even different modes of production of the same animal source foods have very different dimensions. The challenge we face is that all the data come from Europe and North America for these different dimensions of these different kinds of animal source foods. The production, the data is all geared to production in those countries and very little in East and Southern Africa. So that's a big challenge. But I think if we can find the way to do this, um, one of the big challenges of, animal, of true cost uh, of accounting, getting that accepted, the second question was what do we do to overcome that? Um, I think we'll find animal source foods in Mozambique that are nutritious, there's a business case, they're environmentally uh, acceptable, and they will be cheaper for consumers. So a true cost of lens on, on food doesn't necessarily mean more expensive food. 
uh, it can mean less expensive food. I think the other thing that's a constraint is data, and I think the other con thing that's a constraint in getting these, uh, um, these approaches adopted is a lack of specific technical, uh, practical case studies that people can learn from and be inspired from. It's quite scary to say, I'm going to do a true cost of accounting uh, uh, project, but it doesn't have to be. Thank you. My final comment, I love Pavan's quote about another world is on its way. I can hear her breathing. I hope we help her to run faster, run with endurance, and take the rest of us along with her. Thanks. Thank you so much. And I, this is just a quick uh, tour through the depth of activities and initiatives and thinking and research happening around the globe. So I hope that you will follow up directly with any of these panelists to learn more. And uh, thank you so much to the panel. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, Maximo Torero, the chief economist of the FAO, to deliver the closing remarks. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to Pavan and to all the panelists uh, for excellent uh, comments. Uh, in the case of FAO, a true world is on its way already, uh, and we are working intensively to try to change the way we operate and the way we think in this topic. As we know, and we just presented the SOFI two weeks ago now, the numbers are not good, and it reflects a significant problem of market institutional policy failures which are hiding in the functioning of the agri-food system that we need to have to achieve all the SDG goals that we want in place. And behind all these failures and, and market failures and institutional failures are hidden costs. And that's exactly what we want to change. But to be able to change that, uh, we need to come up with a common metric. We need all to agree in that common metric. If everybody is talking of one way of doing things and other ways of measuring, we will never agree and we will never realize your dream, Barry, of having a, a market bond that will allow to capture these things. So the true cost accounting, I think, will allow to estimate these environmental health, social costs, and support decision making to correct for these failures and transform the agri-food systems for the better. We should not be afraid of that. We should not be afraid of measuring those failures so that we can bring solutions to it. This is not increasing the price of food. On the contrary, it's trying to find the solutions to these failures so that the price of food can be accessible, and especially the price of healthy diets to consumers. There are three major groups of these costs. The first are due to dietary patterns that led to differences and, and lower productivity in the labor market. We also have the environmental hidden costs, greenhouse gas emissions, nitrogen. We also have the effects over nature, biodiversity, and other soils and water. So we need to come with this common metric of measuring this so that we can end in an instrument which will be market-oriented. We are talking about losses and losses funds, but we don't know what is behind those losses funds and how to distribute that. I think it's better to create an instrument of the market that will capture that if we have a common metric. So FAO is taking this extremely seriously. It's a huge challenge. And we are afraid, like many of you, but we are going to overcome our fear and we are going to do this. And that's why we have decided uh, to do two years of SOFA it's the first time in the history of SOFA that we decided to do two years because it's a complex topic. In this first year, we are going to focus on the methodological and data aspects that need to be addressed for a greater adoption of the true cost accounting. It will also provide preliminary estimates of a subset of hidden costs for over 150 countries. And in the next year, in 2024, the report will provide case studies with more targeted assessments linking hidden costs to actions that can be taken to reduce them. And I am very thankful to Switzerland for taking this risk. And I hope many of the other countries sitting around here will take the same contribution to this process, because we need to be bottom up here. We need to learn from the countries and trying to find solutions to be able to achieve this. So we, as FAO and as the summit, we aim to integrate the TCA into the agri-food system assessments and policy advice. As our distinguished panelists have testified, advances are being made in multiple areas, and we invite all of you to engage. And we want uh, to move forward on this agenda. And please count on us. We are here to work together with you to make this change, because this is the correct way to the transformation of the agri-food systems. Thank you so much.
Welcome everyone.